Hi, very good afternoon to you. It's Jim from Avstar Observatory. Just thought I'd have a look at the jet streams and have a little talk about those with you in this video. Uh, before we do, a uh, big thank out to those that have been, you know, supporting us over the last week with some uh, funding for the observatory. You know, it's getting tough on us all, I will say that. And, um, you know, I know it's not easy for everyone to help out. You know, this is a bit of a luxury for a lot of people to have, you know, regular updates on, you know, this rare anomaly that we're all facing now, the geomagnetic reversal of our planet. So, you know, a big thank you to those few people that have, you know, still stood with us on the patrons and with the one-off payments on PayPal. Um, big shout out to Skylark Publishing, who yesterday chucked in a few books for us. You know, it is people like that, uh, JBM and Jim, that really do uh, provide the backbone for this observatory. So, you know, I, I have to give them credit along with our patrons because we would just simply not be able to do it. Um, I want to talk about um, our new magnetometer over in Colombia a little bit later on in this video, but I also want to talk about what we've got out there in the field globally and what is um, productive and what isn't and uh, we'll get through that so we're looking at the jet streams um, you know we're coming up to uh, that position on our orbit around our sun now where we're going to start to arrive at the spring and um, autumn equinoxes both over the northern and southern hemispheres and what that does is it creates at that point where we cross that equilibrium of the equinox um, the systems change over the northern and southern hemispheres so you know when we're further away on our rotation around our sun over the northern hemisphere goes into the summer and the jet streams uh, calm down a little bit but when we're over you know when when the uh, southern hemisphere at the same time as the northern hemisphere is at the furthest the southern hemisphere is at its closest angle now our, our earth doesn't tilt it's just the angle of tilt on a rotation around the sun that puts us in the winters and summers i know it's a little confusing for some but i know a lot of you get it so what we're looking at over the, the southern hemisphere is a milder um jet stream pattern even though still fragmented as you can see there's no distinguishable polar and subtropical jet stream when we look at it and it's the same for over the southern hemisphere when we look at that as well you can see that there's more activity going on at the moment with this is about to shift once we cross that um uh, equinox with those two equinoxes and um you know we're going to get more activity over the southern hem uh, the northern hemisphere whilst the southern hemisphere's jet streams are going to start to calm down a little bit which will be good news for countries like australia that have been having these floods as well as other parts of the world as well but it does make me wonder what to expect uh, because we've still not reached the equilibrium of these things that are happening which means the magnetosphere hasn't gone to its weakest so it can still load up those jet streams with cosmic rays and you know cause massive climate disturbances in all variants now droughts floods in you know bringing on forest seasons like we've seen in california early than normal so you know whilst we haven't reached that equilibrium yet and we've seen the magnetosphere drop down to significant low levels we've still got a lot more worse of things to come unfortunately with regards to the climate and this is what we're going to try and keep our eye on and focus on a little bit more not only have we got uh, fragmentation and uh, interchange between the polar jet streams and the subtropical both over the northern and southern hemisphere we've got this which is not so new now because it's, I've been pointing this out now for a few years the interchange over the equatorial region of our planet where the subtropicals are mixing both over the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere and of course you know you can expect this to have some major effects on our climate on our planet as well so i just thought i'd talk a little bit about the um you know the jet stream so it gives you a bit of an idea uh when we're talking about some of the issues like these super jet streams over the southern hemisphere that's forming off of that equatorial uh jet stream and of course you know you're getting like a double whammy of uh subtropical um 
uh, moisture in that region, in that jet stream, and of course it delivers it then further down over the southern hemisphere. And that's why we get these now uh, once in a thousand year flash floods. Even though it's monsoon season, it's like two have come at the same time. It's no surprise because it's a lot of these weather patterns now are being fed off you know, two jet streams, both over the subtropical regions of our planet. And when they come together, you're going to get, you know, twice the amount or even not more than that, you know, a more compounded effect of, you know, uh, precipitation or rainfall in that region, regardless of the season. So we're at the beggar mercy, really, at these of these jet streams, largely caused by, um, you know, the... Uh, the the seeding of the cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere um, you know allowing these to uh, hold more water because you know the seeding effect is obviously a a condensation platform which allows the water the water vapor to condensate on it and then gradually form up to be a water droplet and of course the more water droplets in the app in the jet stream make it very difficult for it to form you know uh, the polar jet streams that we see and the subtropical jet streams that we'd see normally 20 25 years ago so you know like i said the problem is still heading towards the equilibrium point and as it goes along towards that point you know we're going to start seeing you know more extremes unfortunately and you know we can expect these to be now persistent for at least the next 30 odd years or more until we do cross that threshold so I just wanted to go over some of the equipment that we've got out here in the field now M8 is not in Brazil it's in uh, Colombia so it's a little bit more north on the South Americas um, I've got to speak to Michael hopefully I can get hold of him he's a very busy guy hopefully I can get hold of him uh, this weekend and we can try and dig the bug the problem we just don't seem to be getting the uh, data record onto the ST card I'm pretty sure it's something really silly you know that we've um, overlooked um, I might have on the SD card when I super glued the lock to uh, make sure it can be constantly rewritten on and you know not when it's slid in be knocked so that it can't be written on that it would um, make it more reliable but I'm not sure we've got to have a look at that see if I've super glued it in the open position so the data can be put onto the card and not the locked it could be something really simple like that or it might be that the voltage is not um, uh, correct for the uh, the Arduino on board the magnetometer so you know we'll have to look into debugging that and hopefully we'll get the data come up um, in Colombia as soon as possible and that will give us an idea of what's going on in that blue region in front of us here that is the south atlantic anomaly it's the lowest magnetic intensity on our planet right now and i uh, said i was also going to build for michael uh, over the coming months a muon detector to get that sent out to him so we can measure um you know the radiation that is uh you know forming in the upper atmosphere when um, you know these uh, cosmic rays come into contact with the molecules of our atmosphere they create byproducts and all the or subatomic particles basically and that's what we're looking for uh, with our muons we're looking for the increased rate of muons it gives us an idea of what's going on in the upper atmosphere because we know that they're a byproduct so it'd be a great idea to find out how much radiation is actually in that region of Columbia uh, and the South Atlantic anomaly as a result of that weakened magnetism. Um, M2 uh, is slightly over to the left again, that's in Arizona, that's one of our superstars, Scott. And then M1, I know the, these markers are not in the exact places, but they, they give you an idea of what we've got out there. M1 is Kemble in Canada. Then the TriMag is here in the UK along with another magnetometer. Uh, we track the magnetic north pole from here. Uh, we also monitor the intensity over us, over the UK. And then uh, we did send out a magnetometer to India. We never got no, uh, once it got there, we, we didn't get any feedback from that point on. So we presume that we've lost that. We've also lost 
uh, the magnetometer that we had in Hong Kong for a long time. Uh, Tony moved back to Australia and uh, I did send her one out because she had got a, a property in Bali. Um, maybe, you know, uh, you know, we might get some data back from there, but I know Tony doesn't go there as regular as what she was when she was based in Hong Kong. We always got data from there. So what we do have in Australia is um, Jeff and... I keep missing him on Skype. I've got to, you know, have a conversation with him, see what data we've got, and um, you know, try and get. Some, he's got one of our muon detectors down there as well. Try and get some muon uh, data from him as well. Maybe uh, the reason why we haven't had a lot of muon uh, data from him is because um, there might be a fault with the system. You know, we'll get it back here to the UK, try and figure out what the problem is, and then get it back out to you, uh, Jeff if that if there is a problem with the muon detector. Uh, we've lost. The, the magnetometer on the uh, west coast of Australia so we're still in Perth on the east coast but we've lost the one on the west coast but so long as we've got one there um, in that vicinity we can mount, you know, monitor what's going on with that intensity that is moving around Australia Peninsula right now and um, that is it guys you know we're not in a bad shape we could be better That we could have a lot more of these magnetometers out there collecting data but it's um, getting the right people on board, uh, people that are prepared, you know, to stick with it. It doesn't really require a lot of time. You know, it's got to be set up, which is it's going to require probably an hour of somebody's time. And then once a month, they just take the SD card out, put it onto the computer and send it back over here to the UK and we'll process it, all that information. And then upload it up to the uh, website that we've got dedicated to this, poleshiftnews.com. So that's where we are right now with our equipment out there. What's going on with our jet streams? The only thing I would have liked personally to do um, um, in these coming months would have been a little bit more um, self-sufficient in producing my own electricity. It just wasn't affordable to do. I wanted to go over to batteries, but you know when I looked at the prices of these batteries, the ones I particularly wanted, which I knew would do the job, last 20 years, you could get some money for you know back out of those batteries there was like in this for, for a couple of these batteries it was like six thousand pounds see my idea was we're not perfectly suited south facing for solar panels but we could still generate some solar electricity i know it's very critical when they're not directly aligned with the sun that's facing them that they they the um performance of them drop off very quickly but you know, I've got quite a big roof spanner and I could put more solar panels on and they are the cheapest part of pr producing your own electricity. But what I was going to do is in stages, I was going to buy the batteries, charge the batteries up on the um, network, you know, uh, off the local electricity company on the evening in peak times. And then in the daytime, you know, use the energy that I'd stored in the batteries so that I didn't have to rely on having solar panels straight away. That was what I wanted to do, but it just well, it just hasn't worked out this year. You know, uh, I haven't had that, that, that cash to inject into that. There's always been something else that has come along. So maybe over the next couple of years, I can get a little bit more independent on producing my own energy for this um, place where I'm living now. And we all know why that, that isn't. Um, a dream of ours at the moment, don't we? Because we, you know, with the prices of energy going up, the threat of power cuts becoming more frequent, you know, it, this situation is just going to spiral out of control. You know, uh, I've I've heard people talk in the UK to the point where I'm not sure whether they're exaggerating a little bit, but they're saying now that it's almost costing as much to run the house as it is to rent the house. And that's just appalling in a time where, you know, um, there is, a, I believe, an economic slow or downturn globally. And, uh, of course, we know that that means uh, it's going to put pressure on people having the ability to have a simple job that can, uh, you know, pay the bills. I mean, we've, we've found ourselves slowly slipping down this hill. For years now, where you know it's absolutely necessary now if you have a partner that she works, um, 
you know so you know as opposed to where before she'd stay at home or one of the one of the parents would stay at home and raise the kids look after the house whilst one went out and got the the um you know the cash to run the property it's no longer the case is it you know and for some people you know that are not in um you know a relationship with a partner it means that they've got to find the money for everything themselves and you know this is leading to what we're seeing more and more of now you know with um children not leaving the parents homes until they're in their 30s because it's just not uh, economically viable to do so it's just a sad uh place we find ourselves now in this world and you know we, this was a time when i was growing up i thought things would get easier uh, because the technology that we've got but it just seems to it seems to have got worse you know where you know you're having to run faster around that wheel i'm sure you guys all understand what i'm talking about but um you know that i just wanted to give us an update on mainly where we was you know and um what we've got out in the field and you know we've still got masses of amount of, of enthusiasm to keep going you know this is a once in a lifetime uh, and for you know us to be in this um point in time now where this anomaly's come back round after thousands and thousands of years uh you know we've got an opportunity to monitor it and you know i think we'll, we couldn't do any more than what we are with the magnetometers that we've got out in the field you know um monitoring every 15 minutes the magnetic intensity but you know tracking the position of the magnetic north pole every three seconds you know that i believe is in a remarkable resolution and um, you know we will have just millions and millions of data sets on this event when it finally happens um, i'm sure that will be useful globally scientifically when that data gets all put together um, probably modelled um, you know a lot of people can learn a lot from what we've collected and that's what we're all about here not only are we collecting the data but we are able to make some forecasts and that I believe is why people are following us and helping us out keeping the observatory running because it's based on those forecasts that we get heads up like where we are right now with the theoretical 40 degree mark you know we're seven months away from crossing that line um and uh you know we will see what happens when we get there and sure enough it won't be long before we are there and uh you know i i, I really hope that that isn't the critical point because if it is we're going to see a lot more weather extremes and anomalies uh than what we're seeing right now and they can only lead to you know negative things for a lot of people around the world so guys thanks for tuning in um i'll be back in a couple of days with um an earth alpha at a glance where we look at volcanoes earthquakes and co2 levels oxygen levels things like that but from me uh till then you know you take care there is a link down there if you want to help support us become one of our patrons if you would like to um the only other thing to say is to you know take care of your loved ones um, as always, bye for now.